Good evening, everyone. We're going to be uh, going through a series in the book of Ruth with Phil for the next few Grip the Rocks. Woo! So tonight we start in Ruth chapter 1. And if we could have it up on the screen, please. I'm going to be reading it in the Bible in basic English. Now there came a time in the days of the judges when there was no food in the land, and a certain man went from Bethlehem, Judah, he and his wife and his two sons, to make a living place in the country of Moab. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahalon and Chilion, the Epa- no, <laughs> Ephrathites. I was going to say Epaphrodites, but that's not right. <laughs> of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and were there for some time. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, came to his end, and only her two sons were with her. And they took two women of Moab as their wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they went on living there for about ten years. And Malon and Chilion came to their end, and the woman was without her two sons and her husband. So she and her daughters-in-law got ready to go back from the country of Moab, for news had come to her in the country of Moab that the Lord, in mercy for his people, had given them food. And she went out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's house. Says, May the Lord be good to you as you have been good to the dead and to me. May the Lord give you rest in the houses of your husbands. Then she gave them a kiss, and they were weeping bitterly. And they said to her, No, but we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Go back, my daughters. Why will you come with me? Have I more sons in my body to become your husbands? Go back, my daughters, and go on your way. I am so old now that I must not have another husband. If I said I have hopes, if I had a husband tonight and I might have sons, would you keep yourselves till you were old enough? Would you keep from having husbands for them? No, my daughters. But I am very sad for you that the hand of the Lord is against me. (laughs) Then again, they were weeping, and Orpah gave her mother-in-law a kiss, but Ruth would not be parted from her. And Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Go back after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, give up requesting me to go away from you or to go back without you. For where you go, I will go. And where you take your rest, I will take my rest. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Wherever death comes to you, death will come to me. And there will be my last resting place. The Lord do so to me and more if we are parted by anything but death. And when she saw that Ruth was strong in her purpose to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on till they came to Bethlehem, and when they came to Bethlehem, all the town was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not let my name be Naomi but Mara, for the ruler of all has given me a bitter fate. I went out full, and the Lord has sent me back again with nothing. Why do you give me the name Naomi, seeing that the Lord has given witness against me and the ruler of all has sent sorrow on me? So Naomi came back out of the country of Moab and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, and they came to Bethlehem in the first days of the grain cutting. All right. Thanks, Chrissy. All right. So if you don't know me, I'm Phil and that's my wife, Chrissy. We're youth directors here. And we are starting a study in Ruth tonight. Now, we're going to cover every single verse that we just read, so I'm going to be moving quickly. A lot of information is going to be spat at you, so um, try to keep up. All right, so if we can go back to the very beginning of the chapter, we have the verse, the first verse. And my translation is slightly different, so I'm going to read mine because that's what I'm used to rather than that. So first time. In the days when judges ruled, let's stop there. So, 
It was a time period, given that right away, Judges, we know the Bible, we know that there's actually a book called Judges. If you want to know the time period, read the book about Judges, and you can get a great idea about what's happening. And we know that Ruth is actually taking place during this time period. And I will sum up to say that it's a very dark time, a very bleak time, a very wicked time, and time of lots of false gods. But we have this one exception here with Ruth in this story, and we're going to try to dive into that about redemption from this wickedness and things like that, but we're not even close to there yet. So let's continue. Um, there was a famine in the land. So you have no food in the land. And this is not a good thing usually. Famine, no food, usually not a good thing for an entire land. It's like Pottstown because over a famine, probably not a good place to be. So we have to wonder, what exactly is God doing here? Why is he punishing? Bethlehem, or is it just a famine? Is there no water? We don't actually know. This is a big key point, that we don't really know why there's a famine. We just know there's a famine. And we can kind of tell through Scripture that famines usually happen if God is punishing somebody, but we don't necessarily know that's the case tonight. So we continue reading along. Okay, so the famine in the land. Now, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Okay. So, Bethlehem. Does anybody know what the actual meaning, the literal meaning of Bethlehem is? Three, two, one. It actually means house of bread. And if you saw any of the posts we had on Facebook or the website, we have the house with no bread as the title for tonight because there's a famine in the land of Bethlehem. And the Bethlehem is the land of the house with bread. So the house with no bread is Bethlehem and famine. That's where we got it from. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm -hmm. So we know God is withholding food from the land. Okay, now we have this man that we're talking about. We don't know his name just yet, but he's saying to himself, do I stay here or do I move my family to this country, Moab? I know they have food there and it's not too far away. It's roughly 50 miles away to Moab from Bethlehem, basically across the Dead Sea if you have a map. Look at it, it's not too far away. And somehow there's food there. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's like saying, here we have food, but Philadelphia, they don't have any food. What is the big deal? Who knows? Maybe it is God's doing something. Maybe it's not. We don't actually know yet, but we just know that this man that we're talking about is trying to weigh out his opportunities, if you will. Well, where can I take my family? Where can they be going to get food? If I stay here, they might die. If I go there, they have a better chance of getting food at least. So he's weighing out about that. And Moab, again, if you start at the beginning of the Bible, we know that this is actually a country found in Genesis, not a country, rather a people group, rather a man that's born of Lot and one of his daughters. So it's a country, a people group that's born out of incest. So already you're not off to a great start with this whole Moab country. And this man is trying to take his family to there. So maybe not the best idea. So, and actually some of the history about Moab right now. We know that they're a very perverted people and that they have a lot of false god worship, particularly the one of Chemosh. And actually, this false god requires child sacrifice. So why would you want to take your family there to get children? I don't know, but that's what this man is deciding. Anyway, he's decided there's Moab, they have food, we're here, we have no food. All right, so let's continue. Um, I'm at verse one and two. He and his wife and his two sons, they all left. The name of the man was Elimelech, is how you pronounce it. I don't know if you said that or not. Anyway, we have meanings to lots of names, and tonight we're going to try to discover what a lot of these names mean, and Elimelech means uh, my God is king. So, and judging by his character and things like that, he's probably a very prominent man in his time there, and well-to-do kind of guy, Elimelech. Verse two, the name of his wife was Naomi. Naomi, that means she's sweet, she's pleasant, she's a sweetheart. So this man Elimelech married to Naomi, nice and sweetheart. And the name of their two sons were Malon and Kilion. These are not so sweet names. Uh, they mean basically sick and longing or pining or dying. So sick and dying are the name of their kids <laughs> with a sweetheart for the wife and the house with no bread. And typically you wanna have Bible names for your kids sometimes. Don't pick their names for kids. Not great ideas. Okay. So we continue verse two. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. So really, 
again, we go back to Elimelech, and he's this man trying to provide a need for his family. He wants to be the man of the house, get them food, get them shelter, and he has to weigh the cost. Wait, what cost do you say? Well, there's a whole spiritual, spiritual cost of the right now that he has to weigh out. Okay, I have my family, and we have our spirituality here in Bethlehem. If I go to Moab, there's false gods, there's no real God there. But he's completely missing that point. He's just seeing food and jobs. So keep that in mind as you think about where you need to be at. What kind of location are you in? What kind of friends will your family have? Who will your wife's friends be? Will they be Christians? Will they be God followers? For all we know, when they moved to Mel, they were probably the only Christians there. All right. Verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. So he moved to the land to get prosperity. He died. Oh, well. But how did he die? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't mention this. All we know that he did die. And this is, again, prominent earlier with the family. Why did it happen? We don't know. Why did he die? We don't know. These things just kind of happen. There's a passage in Deuteronomy 29 that says, The secrets belong to the Lord, and he is the one who knows why these things happen. Verse 4, um, her two sons. And these two sons took Moabite wives. Okay, this is a particularly sad point. Um, when your kids, when your sons marry, the whole thing of being equally yoked comes into play. This I consider to be dramatically different where you have people who probably believe in God and people who worship a God who requires child sacrifices. This is crazy things happening right now. A lot of bad things are happening. And verse 4, the names of the one was Orpha, the other was Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. So two sons get married. They've been living 10 years. And as we will soon find out, that they actually don't have any kids in 10 years. I think that's kind of unique to the time period, that you don't have kids for 10 years. I mean, what were they doing? Was God doing something, or were they not? <laughs> so all you know is... Something's not quite right in the situation. A lot of things have been going wrong. Okay, so verse, verse 5. And both Malon and Kilion died, so the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. The man, Elimelech, takes his family to find prosperity and health and happiness in the land of Moab and ends up having all the men in the family die. Not a great start. So why do they even move? Who knows? Maybe you can relate to Naomi right now. I mean, a woman, she lost her husband, she lost her two sons. It's probably not a very happy time for her. Not a happy time at all. So let's see what she does. Verse 6. Then she rose with her daughters-in-laws to return to, the country, return to the country of Moab, return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and has given them food. It's fantastic news. So... Okay, everything's horrible. I heard back in my home country, Bethlehem, Judah, there's food happening there, there's blessings happening. We should go back home. Or at least I should go back home anyway. And actually, in that verse is the first time we hear the word God mentioned. It's only mentioned 23 times if you care about that kind of stuff in this book. And it's good to know. But what's also good to know is that God is now blessing his people back in his land. Why not earlier? Why did he have them move to Moab and have the whole family die? Why famine? You don't know. But this does lead to a very, very big point in the whole book of Ruth, which is um, the providence of God, or if you will, like the fate or destiny or plan that basically God has for us. How is God working through the things that we can't see? And that's just it. That there's so many things that happen every day in our lives that we don't see and don't know about and don't know why they happen, but yet if we could see God's everlasting plan, we'd be like, of course I wouldn't change what happened to me today, even though it was horrible. Ten years from now, I'm going to be utterly thankful for this. And um, I reminded of a, a story of actually a friend of Chrissy's recently. They were married five or six years, ballparking that. But they knew each other for 13 years, like high school sweethearts. And then just this past week, actually, the husband was killed in a car crash with their one-year-old child. And I'm sure that the wife is definitely asking herself, why is this happening right now? I mean, God, what is your plan? Why, why me? Why him? Why us? And, you know, I don't have a good answer for her for that at all. And 
that can be brought to the point, well, why does God actually allow these such horrible things to happen? Why does he allow murder? Why does he allow rape and abortions and horrible deaths? And it's not, it's not to blame God for these things, but rather the sin in the world that has come through. And even though God can allow things to happen, he doesn't always call these horrible things to happen. So for somebody who asked me that question, I'd be like, well, it's not God who's causing all these horrible rapes to happen, but rather it's, it's sin in the world. And even though this horrible thing has happened to you, that God can work for, for good, which you sang about in the first song. You make all things work t together for good, which is actually Romans 8.28. So if we believe in God and trust him, of course you can work out our horrible situations for good. And Chrissy's friend's situation with losing a husband, you know, who knows what he has in plan for her in the years to come. But right now it's a very bleak time for her. And it's a very bleak time for Naomi in this story here. So we know that God, though, is a sovereign king. He's supreme. He's the absolute ruler. And he works for good Amen. through many different ways. So... Pick up in verse 7. So she set out from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-laws, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Three girls going on a trip, probably end up talking. They do. In fact, 50% of the book of Ruth is actually dialogue, which is pretty significant, so take that as you will. <laughs> verse 8. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices, and they wept. Very emotional, very sad. But Naomi has the best intentions. By basically saying, you know what, go home, I'll pray for you, and... Have a good life. This is significant, though, that Naomi prays for them. You find a very large amount of the, the prayers in Ruth are actually for others and not for individuals. Like, they don't pray for themselves, or rather, I pray for you. And again, Ruth was probably exposed for the first time to prayer, actually, tonight, or when she prayed on the way. Because she lived in Moab, right, the godless country, and now she's being prayed for. Could have very well, very well been the first time that she's actually been exposed to God. But we'll keep that as we will for right now. We'll continue on to verse 10. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back my daughters. Ooh, daughters. If you notice, up until now, they were daughters and laws, but now they're daughters. Hmm, what is happening? Verse 11. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, you may, that they may become your husbands? If I should say, I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you there wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? Would you wait nine months for me to give birth and then 15 or 16 years for you to marry them? I don't know how we had to be to marry back then, but I know it wasn't as old as we are today. She's saying, I have nothing to offer you. I'm old, I can't get pregnant, and if I could, would you even want to wait for this? This is a significant chunk of your life. Verse 13, she says, No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi is only blaming the Lord right now for her troubles. Maybe her husband calls them to move, and these things will happen, but she doesn't see that. She sees that God should have stopped this from happening. He is the ruler of all. He's dealt bitter with me. He should have stopped this. I'm not happy with him. Even though I prayed for you, whatever. She is not very happy right now. And this leads to another, another small point right now is when we Christians, when we have different struggles in our lives, I mean, how do... How do you deal with them? How do I deal with them? Versus the everyday person on the street who's not a Christian. I mean, at work every day, we deal with, or I deal with different struggles, and I, I'm sure most of my coworkers aren't Christians, and it's really unique to see how they handle situations, which is how, how I handle situations and attitudes and how things let us get to us differently. And ultimately, we should be asking ourselves is not 
why is God doing this to me, but how is God blessing me through this horrible act, which is a, is a great question to ask. And again, we kind of talked about that, where God did not always intend these evil things to happen, but he can definitely bless through them, and which we will eventually get to in Ruth here later on in the book. So we'll continue to verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Hmm. Orpha. She leaves for her gods. She is the one who is, again, like Naomi, turning her back on God. She's saying, okay, tried this. Going back to Chemosh. He's the guy I want to have. And Naomi is really encouraging that by saying, go back to the non-gods. Try something else. I prayed for you, whatever. Maybe even Chemosh, Allah, Buddha, many different options in our world today. And what do people that we know turn to when things don't go right when they pray to God? It's a more important question to ask. Continuing with verse 16. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, but death parts from me. From you. So now we're over halfway through the first chapter, and this is the first time we hear from Ruth, who the book is actually named after. And what is she saying? She's saying that she wants to stay with her mother-in-law, which is somewhat important, but the more important thing is that that prayer that she prayed maybe had a really big impact on Ruth's life. And she's really saying, I want to worship the God that you're worshiping. Even though you're bitter against right now, I want to worship him. And ultimately, this is Ruth's one Christian friend right now. Her mother-in-law is her only Christian, well, not Christian yet, but only God-believing person in her entire life. So she is choosing the high road, even though she can't see it right now, of what she's following her mother-in-law. So verse 18, when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Naomi was convinced, okay, Ruth, you got me, let's go. Let's go back to Bethlehem together. Now, this move for Ruth to go back to Bethlehem is a gigantic leap of faith. It's very bold. It's humongous. Because, right, Ruth, Moabite, she's brought up in a land of perversion and wickedness and false god worship and who knows what else. And she decides to go back to Bethlehem, who are God's people living there and being blessed. So it's like... It's like you go down to Philadelphia and Kensington and say, I want to stay here for a while and wear my nice expensive jewelry or whatever. It's a kind of a risky situation to put yourself in. It's, I have no other examples besides that one. But imagine putting yourself in you know, the, the worst possible place you can be at and try to have a good outlook. And also here's Ruth going to a new land. She has no husband, he's dead, no job, no food, and literally just what she has on her back and her mother-in-law at her side. And they go to a new land. Ruth's really going in pursuit of God who she just met about 10 minutes ago during a prayer. And it's significant because we weren't actually told about Ruth having some awe-inspiring vision or word. She's really doing this without being told to do so. She's just saying, okay, I feel this something to follow you, whatever. I'm going to follow you, mother-in-law. I'm going to trust in this God you talk about, and we'll see what happens. It's an interesting thought that could go through Ruth's, Ruth's head right now. There's a whole point about one, or not one, but first families and second families. The first family being the people that raise you, your moms, dads, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, cousins, grandparents, whatever. And second family being your church body, here family. Now maybe those two are the same, but possibly they're different where your church body is the people you're going to go to when you have a struggle, when you have a hardship, when you have a need. And your first family 
unless they're the same as that second family, their church family, you might not go to them with the same kind of problems. Where if you're dealing with um, hardship at work or school with people not getting along with you, giving you a hard time, whatever, you might not go to your family about that, but you might go to your church family and ask for prayer and for some way or another to work through, work through this. And I think that Ruth is trying to weigh this out. Okay, I have my, my mom, mother-in-law, and my family back in Moab, but I have this possible future family in Bethlehem. And I think she really wants that. She wants to have that deep desire of connection. So as the book goes on, we'll find out. Rather, the chat, or no, the entire book of Ruth goes on. We'll see how that actually changes in her life and what happens. But we'll pick up in verse 19. So the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? So they just arrived there 50 miles later. No journey. Hardships happened. They just arrived. Good for them. It's awesome. So the whole town stirred. That's a big thing. Your entire town, you arrive for the first time. It's like Simon's coming back from South Carolina. Oh, Simon's are back in town. All right. Let's see what happened. But this is Naomi. She's, she used to live in Bethlehem, then left, went to Judah, came back. She's back in town. Okay, this is cool. Um, wait, but your family all died. Whoa, who's this Moabite girl with you? She's kind of iffy. We don't really like them kind of people around here. She worshiped false gods. We worship God. I don't know about this. So you can imagine like the internet, well, not the internet, but yeah, the internet. Bloggers out there, tabloid writers, the sound offs going into Mercury. <laughs> Naomi just came home with the Moabite girl. I don't know about this. Whew. So everybody's watching. Everybody's watching her coming to town. And then in verse 20, Naomi finally speaks to the townspeople. Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So we know what Naomi means. That means pleasant, sweetheart, good person, Mara. This means bitter. Ooh, I went from sweetheart to bitter, but I'm old, so I'm a bitter old woman. Let's just have fun being bitter and old with me. Don't call me sweet anymore, I am mad. So. I don't know if you know this, but we're not supposed to get bitter. We're Christians. We should be happy. We should be cheerful and thankful for God. But Mara, she gets bitter. She gets angry. She's upset. But this is an awesome fact about her, that she is not hiding it. She is being completely honest with the people here. She is, I'm mad at God. He killed my husband, my sons. God, this. And I think it's interesting how she actually opens up to this second family, this Bethlehem people. She's not hiding it at all. She is fine to speak what's on her heart. And how often do we say, hey, how are you doing today? Oh, fine. You know, what does that mean? It means freaked out, insecure, and an emotional. I forget what the N is. What? All of above. <laughs> yes. So it's a the point of transparency, and that's a very big thing for us to try to do every day. I mean, especially here in, in the church, is how do we deal with each other? Are we are we lying? Are we saying I'm great that my life is peachy, peachy and fantastic and I'm, everything is clicking together? Or I have no idea what I'm doing. I am going day by day and trying to find a job that works and a place to live and somehow raise a child. Jeez. So. That's not necessarily all about me. What parts of it could be? <laughs> so transparency is a very big thing to try to hit home with this, is that, yes, we say things just to kind of brush through the situation. Hey, how you doing? I'm great, because I don't want to talk to you. We just keep going along. Not to say that always happens, but it's always better to open up to people, and especially your second church family who you know, if you give them the hardships, you give them your burdens, that they will pray for you and can share the load, which is awesome. So verse 22, it's the end of the story. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the, Mo with, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, was with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That has the grain cutting. I like the barley harvest. 
barley. Don't know if you know this, but around here we grow it. It's awesome. It's the fields that are all like golden brown. Um, I used to do that. You can eat it, it's not bad. Make stuff out of it. But barley harvest. This is completely opposite of the beginning of the story where they were there in famine, no food, had to leave to the ancestral country of Moab where everybody died, came back to Judah, barley's growing, we're going to harvest it soon. This is basically a brand new beginning and this is really the arrival of God's blessings for the, for the country. So we know this story is going places, this is the brand new beginning, what is going to happen? That's in chapters 2, 3, and 4. So I'll wrap it up here. So God calls us to him to be honest, not only with him, but also to each other, especially fellow Christians. And of course, we all have seasons of hurt and pain and seasons of blessings and like triumph. And the big challenge is what do we do within those different seasons when we know somebody who died or got hurt or loved a family member who departed or lost a job, many different things that can give us challenges. Let me go back to the question, not why is God doing this, but how is God blessing you through this? So we have really four main characters in this story, Elimelech, Orpha, Ruth, and Naomi. And I'm sure we can all identify specifically with one of these people tonight. So we have Elimelech. God is my king, yes. I love God. I want to plan things out best I can. But ultimately, when I do it, they're going to fall apart. We'll probably all die anyway. So that's a little like, are you him? Or are you the guy who plans it all out? And, but you didn't plan it out well enough. You missed some crucial part about spirituality in there, and then we all die. Or you're Orpha. She's the girl. Yeah, I tried Christianity. It was cool for a while. But then God didn't do what, he's, what I asked him to do. Eh, don't do that. I had a boyfriend, I prayed for him for a while, but he didn't turn Christian. So, no God, I'll try, I'll try Allah, I'll try Buddha, whatever, you know, something else. Or you Ruth, the one who trusts in the Lord and she walks in faith. She's not foolish, but she's faithful. She's the one who is the bold one. Or Naomi, are you the bitter old woman? Are you moody? Do you blame God for everything? But yet somehow God still loves you. He has no reason to love you. You blame him for everything. But he does. Four different people. And although we could probably individually identify with one of them tonight, we go through seasons of our lives where we can be one of those at any point, where we can be the person who trusts in God but forget about him and everybody dies or turns our back because God doesn't answer us that one time or we actually trust God and be faithful or very bitter and moody. I'm going to invite the praise team back up again as we, we wrap this up and go through some time of worship again. And throughout this time of worship, you know, we'll make it a little bit slightly darker and definitely encourage you to open yourself up to the Lord and see how you're following him, see what he is challenging with you. If, if you're trying to find a place to live or trying to find a job or somebody you know just died or about your children and how they're being brought up, don't ask how is God punishing me or why is he punishing me, but how, how is he blessing me through this horrible situation? And learn from Naomi that it's not good to be bitter. And as the story continues, we'll see awesome redemption, which is the story of Ruth, redemption. Yeah. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness, Lord. That no matter what happens, God, you are still good and you are still sovereign, Lord. Lord, we think about all the people on our uh, bulletin every week, God, the list the list of names and situations, Jesus, the, that our people bring before you to just ask for a solution. We think about those who we have in our hearts tonight, Lord, um, that we know that are going through a rough time, maybe it's ourselves even. Um, God, you are still good in those situations.
situations, Lord. Think about the great things that are happening right now. And we thank you for them as well. You are good over all of them, God. We thank you, Jesus, for the things that you've set in motion, your principles, your laws, God, that we can be 